Welcome. My name is Dennis Kucera. I'm from Tektronix. I'm an applications engineer in the MPEG product line. And today I would like to go over a series of slides from our uh, MPEG Made Easy. So for the agenda, I would like to cover four different areas. One of them will be video compression, followed by transport streams and how they're created, then talk for a bit about PCRs and how they relate to timing between video and audio, and then spend a bit of time on error analysis. So to start with the video compression, we've got four different encoding techniques or types that go on within the MPEG domain. The first one is using spatial redundancy, and that is a, a technique that looks at a lot of different pixels in a field or in a frame of video and looks for things that are similar or identical that it can reduce. Then there's temporal redundancy that looks at successive frames, and that'll look at uh, frame one, frame two, and look for similarities and differences that it can recognize and then use that information to reduce the amount of bandwidth. Then there's a visual redundancy, which will take uh, similarities and differences and actually throws away some information, and this actually causes the film or the environment to be lossy, so it's not going to be exactly the same. And then another mode of compression actually is a statistical redundancy, and you can think of this as if you take a file on your computer and you use PKZip or a zip tool to take that information and reduce it or compress it without actually losing any information, and that's called a lossless compression. And for MPEG, uh, MPEG-2 and MPEG-4, we use mathematical processes uh, called the discrete cosine transform to actually reduce the data and as long as we keep the precision, it can be a completely lossless environment, although we will use some uh, trimming to reduce the bandwidth. But it can be a lossless environment. Now, here's an example of temporal redundancy. And if we start off with the first frame of three on the left, uh, we'll just call that our first or our anchor frame. And for those of you that have ever stored or compressed a bitmap from your computer, it, one of the many modes is using a JPEG compression, which is discrete cosine transform. And there's a lot of white in the background, and it can save that as a, a small sample. But the important thing to focus on here as we look at one frame and then the second frame and then the third frame, there's a lot of, a lot of similarity. And actually the only main thing that's different between these is the position of the football or the soccer ball. In this case, for frame number one, we could compress that, call it an anchor or an iframe, and then send that off to the decoder, and then use that to figure out how are we going to create our following two frames, the B and the P. So if we look closely at the next frame, number two, the only difference is the position of the ball, but if you also look closely in the first frame, you cannot see the kneecap behind the ball. So somehow we're going to have to create that second frame using the first frame and then literally moving the ball diagonally to the lower right so that we can show movement. And then also in order to draw that second frame with the kneecap, we're going to have to have access to the third frame where the kneecap is now visible. So if we have a series of frames in a row, the iframes or anchor frames are pretty simple. We just compress them. And then if we look forward and backwards in time, we can actually find other information that reveals hidden sources, uh, such as the kneecap. And then sending that off to the decoder, we actually only need to send a complete frame for the eye, and then for the next two frames, just difference information. So now when we are recording our audio and video programming, uh, often coming in separately, uh, audio, uh, an audio feed coming in from one source and a video feed coming in, at some point they will be multiplexed together. But just focusing on the video part of it right now, as the video is coming in either by film or by fields or by frames, we're going to segment each one of those frames and call that each one of them an access unit. And as it gets encoded, it can be an I or B or P frame. And in some cases uh, for editing, it could be I only. But we'll call each one of those an access unit. Now, if we take those individual access units and concatenate them together for purposes of delivery to the set-top box, we end up creating what's called an elementary stream. Now, the elementary stream has these frames or fields or pictures all concatenated back-to-back, -back, 
but given the way MPEG is transmitted, we now need to send them, in some cases, uh, out of sequence, out of order, or in some cases, a lot of bandwidth for audio and then video and then shared back and forth. So they're not actually sent sequentially in time. So what we're going to need to do for each one of these access units is add a little header, and that header or wrapper creates a packetized elementary stream, which includes a decode timestamp and presentation timestamp. And so we'll use those to create our elementary streams up to packetized elementary streams and then later put those into a transport stream. So now let me move on to transport streams and first start off with answering the question, what is a transport stream? So the transport stream is part of the MPEG-2 uh, definition back in 1994. The uh, MPEG-2 Part 1 document described two methods of delivering video and audio programming to the user. And one of the methods was a program stream, which was for delivering over a short distance a video and audio program. And that was commonly used and still is commonly used for creating DVDs. So the transmission path or medium is very short. If you needed to go a long distance, such as terrestrial over the air, satellite or cable, it's going to be in a uh, an environment that can have some loss. So what was decided was these elementary streams and pest packets would be divided up into very small bite-sized chunks where we could add some redundancy. The transport stream also allows for a single program or multiple programs, as well as a single video or multiple videos. And again, for audio, single or multiple. And then also the ability to determine which video element, which packet goes with which program. So some scheduling information, uh, which we'll talk about shortly, is added. And then the optional closed captioning, subtitling, private data, and carousel for other additional information was added. And that's all defined in the MPEG-2 or 13818-1 document. Now, if we look at the transport stream again, we had a picture that we used earlier with the video and audio cameras. And if I start with the uh, seven different segments here, we're going to start with two individual flows of video and audio that are related together. And we're going to take those individual flows and we're going to convert them from their fields and frames into an elementary stream and then into a packetized elementary stream where we add the individual uh, PTS and DTS times. Now, point number two mentions that we take these and assign individual packet IDs. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the transport stream header. But this is a way of taking those small transport stream packets and individually identifying each one of them, whether it's a video associated with program one or two or an audio associated with program three or four, so that all of these different packets can be uniquely identified with specific programs. Now, in order to find out exactly how many programs you have, what elements go with which programs, we add program-specific information mentioned in point number four. And no matter whether you want to be compliant with MPEG-2 or DVB or ATSC or ISDBT, you'll need to add the mandatory PAT and PMT tables. Now, in point number five, for those of you that also want to comply with DVB or ATSC, there are some additional tables that we'll talk about later, uh, service information and PSIP tables that will be uh, required. Now, an another thing that we need to do since the video and audio is sent uh, interlaced, although not necessarily sequential, we'll need to add, along with the PTSs that we've already provided, a program clock reference, and that's seen as point number six. That program clock reference is a sample clock from an original 27 megahertz reference, and that will be used in the decoder to realign the video and audio elements. And then finally, after we have all of that information, time division multiplex together, the video, the audio, the tables, and all of that, we then want to transport that out to our satellite, terrestrial, or cable carriers over a constant bit rate uh, pipe. And in order to keep it constant bit rate, occasionally we'll add some null or stuffing packets to maintain a very constant data rate. So now if we look at in a little more detail the transport stream, and this is not drawn to scale here, all transport streams are made up of 188 byte packets. And they always start off with a sync byte. Then there's uh, following shortly thereafter a packet ID, 13-bit uh, value that differentiates the audio and the video PIDs. 
and in almost all cases the header is four bytes long and the payload is almost always 184 bytes long. So these are the small uh, small packets that we'll use to carry the audio and the video and the patent, the PMT, and so on. And then if it goes over the air, we'll add some redundancy, and uh, that'll allow us to recover all of the data even in a lossy environment, such as uh, from a satellite in uh, outer space. So now I mentioned the time division um, or TDMA aspect of all the video and audio elements being wrapped together here. And we have what kind of looks like a film reel here. We have individual transport packets, and uh, it looks as though uh, on our film reel here that we've got an individual picture, but it really it's just a piece of a picture for the first transport packet and a piece of audio for the next one and another piece of video for the third transport packet. But the key thing that we're looking at here is individual 188 byte packets. The thing that uniquely identifies each one is the packet ID. The first one is packet ID of 51. The second one is a packet ID of 64. And in reality, we don't know anything about these until we find the PAT to determine what programs we have, and then the program map table, what elements we have, which ones were audio and video, and then we'll go ahead and assemble those later in the decoder based on the patent and the PMT. So this is like a film reel of all of the different uh, sequentially uh, interlaced packets that will create a single or multi-program transport. Now looking at the same type of a, a display, although in a hierarchical point of view, we still have the reel at the bottom showing a sequence of 188 byte packets. In this particular example, the first one is a 188 byte packet, uh, transport packet with an ID of zero, and that means it's a PAT. The second one is an optional network information table, and then after that, the program map table and so on. So when a set-top box turns on, the first thing that it needs to do before it can put up a picture or a television uh, program is it needs to skim through the associated uh, transport stream that's coming into the set-top box and wait until it finds a packet ID of zero. It can't do anything until it finds the packet ID of zero. So in this particular case, we grab the packet ID zero, open it up, look inside, and see what we've got. For this particular example, we've got a network information table, we've got program one and program two. So we know in this entire flow that we've got two programs time division multiplexed. So again, before we can put up a television picture, we have to at least find a program. So if we default to the first one, uh, the blue row, we show program one has its information stored on packet ID 15. So we now go back to the transport stream and skim and skim through until we find a packet ID of 15. Once we find that, pull it out and say, what's inside? In this particular case, it says the first element is a video element, and all of its transport packets have an ID of 51, and the audio packets are found on packet ID 64. Now we go back to the transport stream again, uh, still no television picture, and we redirect all packets of type 51 to the video decoder and all packets of 64 to the audio decoder, and as soon as we find our first iframe or anchor frame, we'll be able to decode that, put that up on the television picture or television screen, and then be able to start showing moving pictures. So that's an overview of how you make access or use of all of these different packets, starting with the PAT and the PMT, to decode a moving picture. So I talked earlier about the program-specific information tables, and that was the PAT and the PMT. And if you want to be compliant for ATSC, you need some other mandatory tables. And these are called the PSIP tables, Program and System Information Protocol. That's the uh, title that they use. And the ones in red are mandatory, and all but the last red one are found on the same packet ID, 8187, and then the other ones are found on tables defined uh, within the Master Guide table. So these are other tables that allow you to further define your, uh, your television uh, program or channel or brand, whereas in MPEG-2, you only have program numbers, such as program 1, program 2. So if you wanted to brand your transport stream as KATU or ESPN or something of that nature, you would use the ATSC PSIP tables 
to further define each of the individual programs and give it uh, naming information, and that would be contained within the PSIP. Now, on the flip side of that, for DVB, whether it's satellite, cable, terrestrial, or over IP, we also have to use the mandatory patent PMT tables from MPEG-2, but we also have some other mandatory tables that are defined in an Etsy 300-468 document, but an overview of those require you to put in the network information table, time and date, service descriptor table, and event information table, and these all have specifically defined packet ID values where they need to go, and then there's a several other optional ones. I've only listed three there, but this again is, as an example, the service descriptor table is where you would put in your program name, whether it's HBO, Showtime, ESPN, you would put that information in the SDT, and then when your customers are watching TV and they change channels or want to know what's, what else is on, that information will be lifted from the SDT table. So when looking at the transport stream as it's flowing through uh, its pipes as a, a series of 188 byte packets, I have an example screen here, and on the left, I show a series of different packet IDs. So in the middle or bottom block, it shows the SI or PSI tables, uh, packet ID 0, that's always the PAT, and then the program map table and others as well, and then up above, the audio and video elements. So from just a hierarchical point of view, I can see all of the different packet IDs that are made up in this long or nearly infinite string of 188-byte uh, packets. Then on the upper right or middle right, we can see the breakdown of each one of those individual packets. They always start off with a, a sync byte, which is hex 47, followed by several other bytes, one of them being the uh, program identifier. And then down at the bottom of the screen, you can see the entire container, starting with the four mandatory header bytes. And then there's actually an optional program clock reference value in here. And then the rest of the 184 bytes, or what would be that without the PCR, makes up the payload. So now let's touch base on the program clock reference since it's so critical to keeping the audio and video timed. In the encoder, which is a very expensive device, there is a very stable, highly accurate clock, and when we send the video and audio off to the set-top box, which is far away, we no longer have access to that serial or that 27 megahertz accurate clock. So in order to make the two synchronize together, we take an occasional timestamp of that 27 megahertz reference, take a sample of it, put it in the transport stream anywhere from 10 to maybe 25 times a second, and then on the other end in the set-top box, that value is lifted and used to run a voltage-controlled oscillator to maintain its own 27 megahertz reference. So in essence, we're going to take a very accurate clock, take a sample of that or a picture of that, stuff it into one of the transport packets and then deliver it over the airwaves or cable fiber, however you get to the set-top box. And then those occasional timestamps will be used to recreate a running 27 megahertz clock in the set-top box. So in the original definition of PCR jitter, prior to the creation of the TR-101290 document, there was no real stable or de good definition of what jitter was. So when the, with the creation in uh, 1997 of the TR-101290 and then ratified in 2001, we had the definition of PCR uh, intervals, accuracy requirements, and then several other new terminology for overall jitter, frequency offset, uh, drift rate, and then uh, the AC, which I mentioned before. So the TR-101290 is an excellent document for everyone to reference if they want to make accurate measurements of jitter and other related PCR measurements. A simple overview of the overall jitter or OJ measurement is to take a look at the 27 megahertz timestamps inside the transport stream, measure those against a good reference, whether it's uh, using uh, a stable clock inside a monitor and analyzer, and also looking at the variations as when the transport stream was delivered. Now, in the best of all cases, the transport stream will have a good PCR. It'll be delivered over a very stable 
wire line or stable mechanism, and the effects will be zero overall jitter. So OJ is is accumulation of PCR inaccuracies and time delivery mechanisms. So if the clock inside the encoder, that very stable clock, is actually not accurate, it's going to impact the PCR accuracy as well as the OJ. Another scenario would be you have a very, very accurate clock inside your encoder, but you're delivering it over IP that runs through switches and routers with time delay and buffering, and so it actually doesn't end up getting delivered to the set-top box in a very stable fashion. So in that case, the cumulative a result of PCR inaccuracies, which were good, and a variation in delivery, is going to cause the set-top box to create what looks like PCR jitter. So that's a, a simple definition of where overall jitter comes from and how we would measure it. So I mentioned in the previous slide uh, where the you know, what causes overall jitter to occur, and its uh, it, definition within the TR101290 gives us the formulas for filtering, trying to mimic the set-top box, as well as how to calculate the overall jitter. So anyone that's measuring PCR OJ should be using the formulas defined in TR101290. Now, measuring or looking for errors within a transport stream, just because it's digital, going across a wire line or a switch or even over a digital satellite, it could be thought that since it's digital, what could go wrong? But there's many things that can go wrong, whether it's interference, RF, single to noise problems, or in the IP case, a drop packet. Any of these anomalies will cause uh, inaccuracy in the packets and in the highly compressed audio and video cases. Anything that's highly compressed and then corrupt will cause a noticeable artifact within the program, and that will cause the quality of experience to go down and in turn causes customer dissatisfaction and churn and revenue loss. So one of the things that we promote is the measurement and monitoring of these mini transport streams as they're being used nowadays to deliver audio and video programming to the end users. So we have many different layers encapsulated here and we started with the video in the center there in green and we would require elementary stream analysis of that to make sure that there's no problems with the syntax and semantics of the video and audio. And then on the outer layer, packetized elementary stream, making sure there's no issues with the presentation timestamps and decode timestamps. And then outside of that, just at the higher level wrapper of the transport stream, making sure that the service information and the PCR values are all accurate. Well, another thing that the TR101290 has created is a assimilation of all of the different things that can go wrong or need to be made right within the MPEG-2 or for video H.264 and others, and trying to simplify those for operators and has come up with three small categories, priority one, two, and three, where one is the highest priority, and then measurements within those priorities. There's about six different measurements within each one. And in reality, if we're monitoring according to TR101290 and we have any anomalies or measure, measurements with errors detected in priority one, that problem is most likely going to take that transport off air and cause a major problem with the set-top box. So an example would be if you lose the synchronization byte or the PAT goes away, then as we talked about earlier, there's no way the set-top box without a PAT could even find the programming. We have the second priority, which anything that goes wrong in this is going to cause possibly blocking problems, audio, video, timing, or synchronization problems. And then the third priority is mainly focusing on the electronic program guide. So if you had a problem here, you could still receive the signal, you could still decode the signal, and you could still watch the programming. But if you did have a problem with the third priority, you might not be able to see the letters KATU or ESPN. It may just say Program 3. So the TR101290, I mentioned it was started in about 1997 and then ratified in 2001, and virtually everyone follows this now for monitoring and measurement requirements. Very good. But also just recently, the ATSC has taken the TR101290 document and then created some measurements uh, mainly targeted towards uh, broadcast operators and then 
ratified that as the A78 document. Then that document was forwarded to the uh, cable group, SCTE, and then they added a few more parameters, a, a couple more checks, but in essence accepted all of A78, added a few things, and ratified that as the SCTE-142 document. So for the uh, A78 and uh, SCTE-142, it's essentially built on top of the uh, TR-101290, but it comes at the uh, measurements for the program uh, operator or broadcast operator with a little different paradigm. They've created five categories here, and they monitor at the most important or highest level, making sure the transport stream is not off air. Then if you do have synchronization, you have uh, transport stream, they want to make sure the programs are not off air. And then below that, any elements missing. Then below that, quality service. And uh, the very last one that they can monitor is for technical conformance or technical nonconformance. And the reason that they have this is because there are occasional errors seen in the priority one of the TR-101290. And when those errors occur, those may be momentary, but again, when they're flagged and says that your stream has gone off air, it may have been at such a small interval that it actually doesn't take your stream off air. So for the A78 and SCTE-142, we added a few more levels to that. So as I discussed in the previous slide, the first and highest priority for transport stream on air, or making sure it's not off air, is to make sure that you are, this is one example here, always in synchronization, and that means that we are able to see all of our transport stream multiplex programs. Uh, in the case of the example for program off-air, if we have a program map table, which is not allowing us to find our uh, video and audio elements, that tells us that we've got a program off-air. And then again, if we go down one further for the uh, component missing, if we had audio, video, and another maybe a secondary audio, and one of those elements was missing, instead of saying the program is off air, we will flag that a single element is missing. And then below that, we have qual quality of service and then the technical nonconformance. And let's see if I have an example here. There's many, many different tables and measurements that we make, but in, in reality, the main thing that we're doing on top of the TR-101-290 is adding some multiples of time. So on the far right, if you look at the, uh, the column label, technical nonconformance, for TR-101-290, it says the program association table, at least for ATSC, must always occur at least every 100 milliseconds. If it occurs at an interval of 101 milliseconds, according to TR-101-290, that would be in error or catastrophic condition or priority one failure, when in reality it's only one millisecond late and for people changing channels on a set-top box, one millisecond is not going to make that much difference. So we will always make the technical nonconformance test, and then if we take that minimum requirement of 100 milliseconds and double it, in case the PAT is present, but it's only showing up in the set-top box between 200 and 500 milliseconds, we'll say there's a quality of service issue, and if, there, if that's the case, uh, that will light up the QoS, LED on a monitoring device. And then the last row that we have is, in case the PAT is not occurring at least 500 milliseconds apart, meaning it's five times worse than the standard requires, then we're going to say transport stream off air and everything else to the right of it is flagged. So that's one of many examples provided in the uh, A78 and the SCTE-142 document. So now in summary here, the DTV systems, which use MPEG-2, are quite complex, but the fundamentals, the video and the audio, the compression and multiplexing, should be fairly easy to understand. We're going to be bringing in a video and audio, and we must always insert the program-specific information tables. That was the PAT and the PMT. And then if you want to comply with the DVB or ATSC, you also have to have the mandatory SI tables or PSIP tables. Now, the PCRs, which I, I touched on, are very, very critical if you want to be able to maintain accurate timing relationship between the audio and the video. So it's very important to not only insert those with the encoder or the remultiplexer device that you would be using, but it's also important to make sure they're transmitted through the wireline, RF, or IP, however it be, 
and make sure that the packet uh, packet intervals are maintained as well. The measurements that we use that we talked about are TR101290, and then the other ones recently announced are A78 and SCTE142, and these allow uh, a good operator experience to simply look at a high level and see whether their transport streams are on air or off air or they have any components missing. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time, and that concludes my presentation.